Hey fellow cultists, it's Sandy Peterson, and today we are going to talk about the primeval map. Um, first, I want to make some points. The uh, Some people have asked about the quality of the map we're using. This is not the real map. This is a laminated uh, printout. The actual maps are mounted on cardboard and folded like this one. Okay, in fact, this map I believe is being made by the same factory we're going to be using, though obviously the art's quite a bit different. So you can see what the, it's, you know, it's going to be solid, foldable like that. I just don't have those here yet because, you know, prototype stuff. Okay, now, um, also another, uh, uh, this map, the primeval map, has kind of been the red-headed stepchild of the expansions. Um, probably the least popular as far as people ordering it. I think it's because it's not as sexy as the other maps. It doesn't seem as sexy because it doesn't have its own monsters that come along with it. And maybe because at least initially it cost a little less. So people thought, well, if it costs less, maybe it's not as cool. Um, but it's actually, which is kind of a pity because it's actually a very intense, exciting map. It's super fun. So we're going to talk about it today and, and see what you think. So let's zoom in on the map now and start talking about it. So what you have, here's the map, and you can see that it is obviously the primeval Earth. We have Atlantis and Mu, Lemuria, uh, Hyperborea and Thule, Lomar, all kinds of, of places that uh, obviously existed in the primeval Earth. Um, there's a lot of oceans covering the, the outer areas, but it's all separated by this big bar of, of Earth. So the, the, the layout of the map is, of course, really different from the regular map. It's actually a lot harder to move around on this map than on the Earth map. Uh, distances, you know, if you're, if you are, for example, if you are uh, crawling chaos on the Earth map, you, from your starting area, you can hit any other area on the whole map. But here, you know, you can't even get to uh, the central uh, area with, with your starting area by flying because it's, it's so, uh, it, it's like so subdivided. So that's just part of it. It's like a slower moving map. It feels more primitive in that way. And the other obvious thing is we got these glaciers spotting all over that these glacier markers. So let's talk about how the glaciers work. Um, at the at the start of the game, of course you have your can can this be seen? Yes. Okay, here's Cthulhu starting with his with his his uh, thing and I'll put a few couple cultists. Really he'd have more cultists than this, but just for example. You start in that area and you do your first turn and then during the next doom phase the first the, the, the glaciers appear in every area where a player has started. So this is what the glaciers look like, sort of. Um, the real glaciers, we're going to make them translucent, transparent. Uh, we didn't have the transparent plastic for these, so they, they're just made of dark, they look like rock. But the real ones are going to be transparent and look all icy, which, is, which I think is neat. Um, that makes them slightly more um, brittle than a regular piece, so like don't step on them or use them to support a table leg or something. But they're, they're going to be sturdy. So the glaciers fit on the gates. Okay, so all the starting areas get a glacier, and if there's a glacier on a gate, no one else can be there. We just put the glacier there. So lo and behold, um, all the areas, all your starting areas are filled with glaciers, and, and you can't have a gate there anymore. Okay, now on each subsequent turn, okay, two areas fill in with glaciers, and the, uh, um, the, op the uh, starting player gets to pick where those glaciers go. They have to go on somewhere that has a glacier marker though. So say you were Cthulhu and you had to place two glaciers. Well, you probably wouldn't pick one to go here if you had a choice. So you might like go here and here. You know, and the next turn, two more glaciers get placed, say here and here. And then it keeps on going until all the glacier markers are filled with glaciers. And then only does it stop. So eventually like, Right, so you missed one. I missed one. Which one did I miss? The one where the cult is. Oh yeah, eventually it's got to get him too. So poor guy. Okay, so eventually all these areas have glaciers on them. There's always a core area that doesn't have glaciers. Okay, now so typically when a play, when players realize that this is how it works, and the map gets these glaciers that accumulate during the course of the game. Generally, it doesn't. It's not all filled in like this until the last turn of the game. Then the question is, well, well, so this is like a low point scoring game with a low number, uh, uh, like not as much power, it seems like it's going to be a slow brutal slog. That's not how it works at all. And here's why. Okay, after the first turn of the game, say that, well, let's, let's get these guys off. Okay. 
So the glaciers come on and they fill in the, the four areas at the start where you're born. This is a five player map, so I guess it'd be the five areas. The five areas the players started, right? And, and everyone's kicked off their gate. Well, man, I don't get my two power for that gate, right? But here's the key. You get one power for each abandoned gate, and all five of these gates is abandoned. So yeah, Cthulhu's missing out on his two power for his uh, for his starting gate, but he gets one power for it because of this, and then he gets four more power for the other abandoned gates. Okay. Don't Pardon? those go on? Don't those go on after the gather power? Yes, these go on after gather power. The first turn it won't matter. The second turn it won't matter. The third turn it kicks in. And you start getting this big power boost. So on a typical turn, so like the least power you can have <clears throat> is typically you have at least one of your own gates somewhere on the map with the cultists on it, right? And then there's the four or five um, gates that have uh, glaciers on them. So you have at least seven or eight or nine or ten power. So a game of the, the, a game of, on the primeval map is not a low power game, it's a really high power game. Everyone tends to have a high amount of power kind of all in the same range because you're all getting the power from the, uh, <clears throat> from the abandoned gates. So the game is like more equal in a sense as far as power goes. It's hard to get a big edge in power. If, in fact, if you own two gates with cultists on them on this map, that's pretty good because normally they're all being eaten up by the uh, by, by the, the Ice Ages. So everyone has a lot of power. <clears throat> this is the first thing to understand. And the second thing is that, so you all have 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 power, and there's not very much area to fight in because you're all fighting over the same number of areas in the middle of the map. So it becomes a really intense battle in the middle of the map, trying to take over Atlantis and take over the Ocean Trench and kill the other guys here. So it's like everyone, so it's like you have a pot like a much smaller pot and you've poured a bunch of scorpions and tarantulas in it and they're all going at it super heavily and that's what this map feels like. It feels like a really um, vigorous fight where everyone has a lot of power. It's easy to replace your losses. Even if you're completely, even if you have control of no gates at all, you know, you still get five or six power from the abandoned gates and you, and you get uh, five or six power from your cultists and you have, you have power aplenty okay, to do things with. So uh, you can easily spawn a bunch of units and, and go in there and get your great old ones back cheaper and do things. Now one of the differences is the way this map works, not only is this a super intense fight going on with everyone having power coming out their ears, but normally we're gonna talk about the Doom Track a little bit. Here's the Doom Track. Uh, well, you know, this is our prototype of the Doom Track. I mean, this is how it works, okay? <clears throat> and I would say that in a, that, that there's two different ways the game can end. One way it can end is if the uh, someone's doom points get up to get up to 30. Okay. The other is if there's so many uh, rituals done that you get up to the uh, instant death marker. Now I would say that about about a fourth of the time in a typical game on the normal map, um, the victory points get to 30 and the ritual death hits its top at the same time. So they both end the game kind of at the same time. I would say that in about the other two thirds of the game on a normal map, it ends because someone gets to the 30 victory points. And about 15, 20% of the time maybe, it ends because someone got to the ritual track here before they got to the 30 doom points, okay? Well, that's on a normal map. On this map, it probably ends 75, 80% of the time because we got to the rich instant death. Okay, so the game doesn't last longer, even though you're getting less doom points from uh, from your uh, from your victory points because you don't own very many gates. Everyone's doing a lot more of the ritual tracks because you have more money, and because if you have only two gates, it's worth doing. And everyone has the great old ones out. So what happens is there are a lot more rituals. So the game. A typical game of Cthulhu Wars ends in the fifth or sixth turn, and a typical game on this map also ends in the fifth or sixth turn. It just ends at a somewhat lower doom points, but a more higher ritual uh, a track level. Okay, so it still is not, it doesn't drag on at all. It's exactly the same length, but with more points here, because you can afford to do more of those, it's better for you, and that's how it works. Um, <clears throat> so that's how that that's how the flow goes. It feels it, it, you you have different strategic considerations than a normal map because you're more focused on a few areas and getting your ritual track up and holding on to those two places and making sure that if you know if you're not if you really want to place in West Atlanta, so you have a central area to strike from, and uh, as one example, and. Uh, 
Usually Shub Niggurath is doing a lot more avataring around. You're more willing to risk your great old one because it's easier to get them back. And because you want your great old one to be getting those those uh, elder signs for your ritual track, because elder signs loom larger in your consideration than a normal game because you're getting less total doom points. So if you're in in the, in the typical game, like usually your doom points are like 18 or or 20 or 20 or more of your your victory points, and uh, your elder signs are maybe are maybe a third or less of your points. Okay, but in this game, the elder signs are maybe half of your points. Okay, because you're getting, you're getting fewer Doom points. So uh, that's how this map works. I hope that my description is interesting to you and, and, and piques some interest on it. Because we this is a very popular game to play, actually. And uh, so uh, that's the, uh, the Primeval map.